My name is Joshua Gibson, and you are listening to the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast, a show dedicated to promoting a message of critical thinking as it pertains to strength training, nutrition, and well-being. This is done through interviews with experts, high-level athletes, coaches, and people heavily involved in strength sports and athletic development. Pull up a chair, grab a coffee, and let's get on to today's podcast. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Gibson, and I'm joined today by one of the smartest people uh, that the podcast has ever been graced with, Chris Tabor. How's it going, Chris? It's going great, Josh. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah, I'm always I'm always walking that fine line of shit talking and just absolutely like romanticizing the guests and, and making them out to be the the best thing since sliced bread. So I opted for that today, um, which, you know, it, it, I think was the correct option given that we're, we are going to discuss the weightlifters guide to the clean and jerk, which was a book that um, I co-authored with Max Ada, who uh, sadly, very sadly couldn't join us. Um, but we want to talk all about the book. You edited the book I mean, you made four or five passes all the way through. So I think that underwent a lot of refinement and honestly is like a much, much better product, uh, product because of it. So before we, we get into the actual content itself and talk about the clean and jerk, maybe you could just talk about what your experience was like kind of going through it initially and kind of making those, those passes and then what your thoughts are kind of uh, uh, about the book kind of at large now. Yeah, so this book follows uh, off your first book that you wrote, the, the Weightlifter's Guide to the Snatch. And then this built into the Clean and Jerk, which it became a lot larger of an undertaking because there's actually two portions instead of one. So you had both the clean and the jerk to discuss and break them down into detail. So I think what's really nice about this, just like the first book that you put together, is the holistic nature where you, you start in the very beginning, give a little historical record. And then you break down the phases, the biomechanics, you get into some programming, and then you get into queuing. So it's kind of like an overarching look at the clean and jerk and how you can build it, really helping both athletes, like this is what my coach might be looking for and what they might be able to take from it. And then also coaches being able to pick up a process of teaching the clean and jerk and then having feedback and steps in between. So I think it really went from start to finish and gives people a nice overview of the clean and jerk as a whole. Well, I think I think that point is really one to take seriously because the progressions laid out in the book, both the weightlifter's guide to the snatch and the weightlifter's guide to the clean and jerk are progressions that I'll use, say, you know, we have new kids in the weight room at, at, at the high school, and those are progressions I'll just pull out and say, okay, we're going to start with, you know, muscle clean plus a front squat. And then we're going to start with a tall clean. And then maybe we add in the contact drill. And it's like, those are exercises that you can kind of, you know, pull and, and, and put in, um, in and change as you need. But having that like foundation, that template of how am I going to consistently, reliably teach the snatch and the clean and the jerk to beginners or how am I going to reteach people who have been doing it for a long time? I think that idea, and one we come back to very often in the podcast, is having having a process to refine versus kind of, <laughs> I don't think it would be rebuilding the wheel every time it, because you wouldn't know, you would just be building something um, that hopefully moves. But it's like, have something, improve it instead of trying to reinvent it. Um, and, and I thought that's like a critical part of it. So you know, the book itself, I think, lays that foundation for many components. And although it's not a treatise on any one, you know, we don't kind of have like a thousand citations for periodization. I think it does do a nice job kind of introducing the history of it, the teaching progressions, the biomechanics, the programming components, and then tying that together and saying like, in practice, this is what it could look like. And I I think that's going to be critical for for coaches and athletes. Yeah, I I totally agree on all those. And I think the way that it's laid out will help with the acquisition of the clean and jerk more quickly. And so there are many ways that you can teach the lifts. There's a thousand systems. People can go into more or less detail. 
but it comes down to error reduction as quickly as possible so that you can refine good movement patterns. And I think this lays out a logical way to take someone through from not knowing anything about this to being able to perform the lift in short order. And you also provide a beginner program, which can be followed, and then an intermediate program, which can be built on after that. And so it addresses really the initial two steps of an athlete's career and lays it out in a systematic way. So someone who even has a process now might find new ways to integrate in some of the items that you built Mm. to help with their coaching process. Like this exercise I hadn't thought of might bridge the gap in my teaching progression so that the person I'm working with acquires the clean faster or the jerk faster. Those are always nice to go through it and look at how other coaches build out a coaching progression for the lifts because you're always going to pick up something new or you might need to try it with someone that's just really not getting what you're coaching. You might be able to pick up a new uh, set of skills that way. Yeah, those are those are really well taken points. And I think to kind of emphasize what you just said about kind of developing your own process, um, it's kind of funny because you've sent me a bunch of papers and I, I think sometimes, sometimes I'll make this comment. I'll read a paper and say like, I didn't know research like this exists or, or like you can find it. Uh, one of those papers was something looking at like elite level performance and like the factors that, that play into that. And I was like, Oh, this is just like a really cool piece of, of, of kind of like intellect to read someone thinking about peak performance and the genetic components and the cultural environmental factors and, training related factors and that you know that extends all the way to the the history of of weightlifting olympic weightlifting and you've sent me a few papers that talk about like the history of the press and kind of like the history of the sport from from different lenses so one maybe in, over in the uk um talking about how the sport developed and, and grew into what it is and i think having that understanding of like okay so when you tell me the teaching progression for the snatch is you know, whatever it is, tall snatch, contact drill, above the knee, below the knee. It's like that is all predicated on what came prior, right? That's all predicated on this idea of having two competitive movements, the biathlon, so to speak, with, you know, one minute clocks and uh, two hour weigh-ins and all these, all these stipulations and criteria to say like, this is, this is weightlifting and this is how it's going to be performed. When it was developed initially, and I don't know how, um, kind of closely or you've you read those papers or how much thought you've given it but i think it's just fun to kind of talk about or it would be fun to talk about um you know a his, the history of the clean and jerk and, and specifically the press because you actually sent me a citation or a paper um that talked about the the volume of pressing that was done you know prior to its abolition which is like a large part of training i think it was like 30 mm-hmm. percent uh, of an athlete's training volume would come to from the press and now I think we barely think of it as an accessory exercise. You might have, you know, you might have some seated press on one day. You might have some standing press, maybe some dumbbell presses, but there's no way in the world you're doing, you know, three days a week of pressing. Uh, and even, even beyond that, you're probably not going to do supplementary exercises like a partial press or a pin press, or, you know, maybe a press from the front press from behind the neck. So I think where weightlifting used to be with, uh, the triathlon and the inc- like the inclusion uh, of the clean and press pretty drastically different. So maybe you can just talk about your thoughts on, on where weightlifting was with the clean and press, how it's evolved. And if there's anything we could have learned from that period of time. Yeah. So I'm not a sport historian. So if any of them tune into the podcast, <laughs> uh, I apologize. I'm just a, an amateur person that's read some, some items, but You know, pressing has always been a part of strongman uh, events and then what we would call like performers like Eugene Sando and all of those athletes in the uh, really late 1900s. There was a large emphasis on the press. How could you lift the most amount of weight overhead? And a lot of these athletes were brutally strong. So slow pressing worked for them in a various ways of getting the bar overhead. You know, they would do things like the continental clean where they'd put it on their stomach and bring it to their shoulder and then press it from there. But then it was 
uh, formalized in 1928 when it became the three lift uh, competition, the, the triathlon era. So you had snatching, you had the clean and press and clean and jerk. And because there were three lifts, people could press quite a bit of weight and that would help to bolster their total. So they put a lot more effort and training means into developing the press because it also carried over to the jerk as well. They had, they had a nice carryover between the lifts. And so what you see for a while is that the, uh, the clean and press and clean and jerk were not that far apart for many lifters, especially the super heavyweights, because that's how they could pick up extra kilos in competition and, and really set themselves apart. So the weights that were pressed by these athletes from 28 until its abolition in 72, they pressed tremendous poundages. And this went from all the way in the lightweight classes up to heavyweight. There were some huge presses completed by these athletes. And that really speaks to the time they dedicated to developing this pressing strength. Yeah, it almost makes me wonder, because I remember I might have it might have been a podcast with Mike Bergner, but he said he clean and pressed 400 pounds. And I think I think you talked to a lot of those, the a lot of people who were in weightlifting before the abolition of the press or around that time or back when they were still still training it pretty heavily. And you, you realize like those guys were really strong and, and who knows if it's like selection bias or what, but that almost makes me wonder if you devoted as, as much of the training resources as they did to the press, actually how high you could get that. And then obviously like the benef how beneficial that is, who knows, but how badass is it to press over 300 pounds? No, it, how, how badass is it? Yeah. To press 315 pounds. And I think, a lot of us uh, probably circumscribe to this more like deterministic mindset of why, well, you know, training the press once a week, I, I can only press, you know, 80 kilos. It's like, yeah, but if you did 30% of your training volume to the press, I'm guessing it's going to move somewhat and maybe it doesn't skyrocket, but like there's probably a higher ceiling than you would imagine. Um, yeah. We often forget that there's a technique to the press and it, the, the judging became so lax Right. With the press that the technique really evolved from like a strict military press with your feet together and the body held straight to the lean back or sway back press that we see at the end. So if you if you type in the press near 72, it doesn't really look like a strict military press. There's a definite technique that has to be ingrained with the press. And that's how they were able to lift those really heavy weights and ultimately why it was removed. Because people were laying back so far. It was like a standing bench press in some cases. And then they'd stick their head through their arms. So um, I think it still has a place in training. It's probably de-emphasized too much in some systems where maybe just having shoulder or your shoulders become stronger from pressing might actually help your jerk. Mm. I know that recent research from Soriano showing the correlation between the press and the jerk. You know, it probably warrants some revisiting in the plan. Now, clearly we're not going to put 30% of the training total in the press because it's not going to carry over that much, but probably need to dedicate a little bit more time if that's your weakness. The mission of Weightlifting House is to bring the sport of weightlifting closer to the coaches, fans, and athletes. They're able to do this by supporting the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast. You can use the code PHILWL, that's P-H-I-L-W-L, at the USA Weightlifting House store. That will save you 10% off all products, including bars, straps, wraps, singlets, and anything else you could imagine. That is Phil W L P H I L W L to save 10% off everything at the Weightlifting House store. And by supporting the podcast, you support Weightlifting House. Yeah, and I remember I, I kind of, I think I sent you the the book initially for an edit and you, you kind of um, commented on the different styles and how the, the French initially, so the, the agreed upon, upon style of the press, as you mentioned, aim for strictness. So that literally is like head forward, erect, heels together. And that was enforced by the French. Kind of funny, but there was more variation and, and a lot of the laxity came from the Germans. And, and uh, it was like, I think it was at the at the Los Angeles games in 32 or around that time where USA didn't do really well. And they attributed their loss to their strictness with their technique. And then eventually Bob Hoffman came in and was like, all right, we're trying to win. You know, we're not trying to adhere to this like really strict, uh, perfect 
perfect style, um, which I thought was funny. I, th- I think it's interesting to see those different pockets. And just like we see with with weightlifting currently and how there have been camps of, you know, you have to you need to lift like, you know, Team China or you need to lift like Team Bulgaria or you need to lift like Team Italy. And I think all real, all, all those teams really are doing are approximating their best bet of, of what's going to put the most weight on the bar. And kind of based on the training style, based on the athletes, based on the coach's experience. But I don't think it's just like mad. I don't think it's likely as much of a, um, you know, secret science as, as we'd give it, try to give credit to. Um, whereas here it's like the Germans just want to win. So they're going to lay back. They're going to get, get away with as much as they can. And, you know, I, I guess with snatching and clean and jerking, you can't necessarily do that, but you're going to opt for whatever allows you to put more, most weight on the bar, uh, regardless necessarily of how it looks. And actually on the cover of the book is, uh, Carlos Nassar and, uh, Carl, Carl Penny, uh, well-known known personality uh, in weightlifting. You know, he, he's like, it's funny you have him on the cover and with his like style of technique um, as opposed to someone who maybe looks a little bit better. But um, I guess when you snatch, what, like 180 kilos and clean and jerk, nearly 230 at 89, like... You get on the cover. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I thought those are those are those are kind of funny aspects of of the clean and press era, and then you also you you know you had a bunch of great resources. So I think if people are interested, obviously you buy the book. That's like the first place to go to kind of read. It's like the TLDR of these papers, and then if you're really interested, you can reach out to Chris or myself, and we can kick you some of the papers that talk about the history of the press and um, some of the papers written you know through Iron Mind. Um, that kind of discuss this or, or maybe like other websites, but there was this, um, there's this kind of like sequence of, um, in the 44 years, uh, that the press was included in the Olympic games and, and it wasn't until 36. So it was included. And then 36, there was a German heavyweight who cracked the 300 pound press barrier. It wasn't until another 20 years later, that Paul Anderson of the U- of the United States added 100 pounds to that, pressing 402 pounds, and then less than a decade later, that uh, uh, Vasily Alexiev would crest the 500 pound mark, um, and he actually holds the the heaviest clean and press at 236 and a half kilos, which is just absolutely obscene, like uh, absolutely obscene, and the fact that there are like multiple 500 plus pound clean and presses is ridiculous. Uh, Serge Redding is one of them. He claimed to press 228 pounds in Lima, Peru. And obviously these all vary in the degree of, of knee bend and layback and pop off the shoulders. But regardless, I don't, I couldn't hold 500 pounds any place on my body, um, let alone get like a nice little layback and pop to get it overhead. So I think, I think that's really impressive. And, and shout out to Bruce Clements who allowed us to use some of his pictures. Um, which we have. So we have Serge Redding and Ken Patera demonstrating some pressing technique, which is, which is really cool. And they have metal plates on the barbell, uh, which is kind of like a mark of that era, but yeah, really, really remarkable feats of strength that, you know, we see today, but just in different contexts. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think that's like the initial section. We kind of break into that and then we get into the clean and jerk itself so, Chris, instead of just focusing on the book and, and kind of laying out, you know, how to clean and jerk the biomechanics, uh, the phases, you know, at least for those sections, what are some of your non-negotiables with the clean and jerk? When you think about those movements, what are you looking for maybe in an athlete? And then what are you looking for in a movement to maximize the performance of the clean and jerk? Yeah, so from the clean, we'll, we'll start with that since it's two movements, I think some non-negotiables are how the athlete and barbell move together and there are some key items that you'll find with pretty much everyone when you watch them right off the floor the bar's got to stay close you've got to stay flat-footed the bar's got to stay with the athlete and then as you're transitioning up to the hip you should build speed as the lift goes should become quicker at a certain point depending on the athlete's build the bar should brush their thigh at some point and the athlete and the bar should move up as one together. 
Now, to what degree some of those items happen, like how far back do your knees need to move? How close does the bar need to stay? Where it touches your thigh and how high up in your thigh it brushes is really dependent on your, your body proportions, but they're all going to look about the same. And then you need to have balance within the system, right? You can't be back on the heels. You can't be too far in the toes. And none of that's going to change with any athlete. There will be small nuances based on strengths. Maybe someone's legs are stronger than their back or vice versa. But those are, those are non-negotiables. If you're on your toes early or if you're back in your heels at the knee and the weights behind, you might save it with light weights, but you get to limit attempts you're going to miss. Mm. And those are things that you try to iron out in the lifts. So I would say that that's important for the clean. Um, I wouldn't say any two athletes would be exactly the same in their body proportions. So they might look a little bit different executing the lifts, but how they move with the barbell is going to look relatively similar. And obviously there's degrees of freedom, but you're not going to see crazy changes uh, yeah. except for like that guy that cleans with the sumo <laughs> clean or that the other guy from Kazakhstan that has that really weird double knee bend technique. Like these are very, don't teach anyone like that, right? Like that happened in the end, but that's not what we're looking for. Everyone else looks basically the same in the clean. Now, the jerk, highly technical lift, way less room for error in the jerk. So some things you're going to look for in the jerk, uh, getting set in the right position, you know, bracing effectively, taking a nice deep breath and being stationary before you start. Yeah. A lot of people try and rush it. And you need to get that really nice set position before you initiate the dip. A lot of people will start to dip while getting tight. And then they have to organize under the barbell and with the heavy weight doesn't really work. So we do want to see the bar over the middle portion of the foot for most of the dip and drive phase. Right. So the bar is staying over that and you want to try and keep the torso as upright as possible. And when you do that, that means the lower body is doing most of the motion. And that comes from the ankles, knees, and hips moving in the right position. So unlock the knees. The hips might travel slightly behind, depending on your build, allowing that bar to stay right over the middle of your foot and your base of support. From there, the bar is going to drive vertical, and you're going to uh, most likely split under the bar. You could do a power or squat, but, you know, most of the people are doing the split. So from there, as long as you have that initial dip and drive being over your base of support, you're going to be in a better position to receive the bar. Um, from the split jerk perspective, uh, where your feet hit, you know, back foot first, front foot first, just depends on the lifter and the system that they were taught. But ideally, front shin is vertical or slightly back towards the lifter. You got a bent back knee. Both feet are pigeon toed in to create a vice grip. And then you're catching the bar right over your base of support behind the ears. Mm. If you hit those things, usually it results in, in a more successful uh, jerk. And then there's obviously the timing of all the lifts. But I think those are non-negotiables in the clean and jerk. Yeah, I think those are great. And I think we go into those relatively, we go into those really well in the book, kind of highlighting those kind of major points of as an athlete, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish as a coach? What are you trying to see happen? And if you can line those up, you're generally going to be greeted with success. And then, and then you kind of hit to a point where like your technique really falls off a cliff or you're not strong enough to move the weight, hit the correct positions. I think one thing that I've, you, that makes more sense to me now that I maybe struggled with in the past is you kind of think of, you think of, you, you know, you think in terms of, camps or styles realistically when you get to the mechanics of it, it it is almost about staying as compressed with the weight as possible and what i mean by that is like as chris mentioned you're trying to keep the bar as close to your body as possible you're trying to stand up to allow the weight to move in to reach kind of that midfoot position and then you're adjusting to keep it there so at no point are you trying to like bring your knees back and extend for any other purpose rather than to clear the road for the bar. And then when you transition, you're in a really start, strong position to explode, pull and go under. Uh, and then same with the stand up, right? You want to rack the bar as quickly as you can, 
time it so that you're not having it drop on your shoulders. And then you're trying to basically from that point, go straight down, straight back up. Any deviation from that middle point, like that most compressed section is going to be really hard to recover from. And, and I think that was something that was like propagated, propagated, like push earlier on from say more like, you know, the team China camp of like, just lift more midfoot, not a ton of deviation backward and forward. So you'll see that, but but it isn't like wild swings for wild swing sake. It's more so like position, get to position, hold position, and then execute from there. Uh, same with the jerk, right? Same with the jerk. A lot of it's like, can you dip dip and drive straight? Can you split under the barbell and get in a position where the bar's over your shoulders, over your hips, in between both feet, um, really balanced. So I think that's all 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 kind of great great insight, and in knowing that, right? knowing that we start to get into how do we make it happen? So there's that process of improving or altering skill acquisition. And then that process of developing like the adaptations that support maximal performance. And uh, that's why I thought it'd be important in the book to talk about periodization. So I, I like the uh, definition that Aaron put forth in one of his papers, Aaron could put forth in one of his papers. Um, when you think about periodization, What's the definition that comes to mind for you, Chris? Hey, what's up, weightlifters? Danny here, founder of Onyx Weightlifting Co., a leather accessories company specializing in weightlifting gear. In our shop, we make gear that doesn't get in the way of your performance because we understand that hitting lifts requires your full attention. Our straps, wrist wraps, and belts are designed to be comfortable and reliable, so all you need to do is make lifts. Thanks for listening to our friend Josh's podcast. You can continue to support him by visiting our online shop at onyxstraps.com and using his code PhilWL. That's P H I L W L at checkout. See you on the platform. Yeah, I know you like Aaron's. I like Dr. Stone's. It, it's a, a logical and phasic method for manipulating training variables with the end goal being a increase in performance. Mm-hmm. That'd be Dr. Stone and Plisk definition. And so I like it because it follows the the terminology logical, you know, using logic and reason. And it's phasic, which means it goes through phases of training. We're going to revisit them over time. And then the manipulation of training variables, all the ones that we've talked about before. So I find that to be the most uh, the most clear definition of periodization in, in my book. Yeah. And how much of that how much of that do you think is keeping it intentionally, I don't want to say intentionally vague, but the the language is very precise to not say anything about sets, reps, more specific adaptations, right? They're not, it's not conjuring up this image of a program. It's conjuring up this image of here's a process defined by alterations across time to an end goal or end point. So how much, how much intentionality do you think is there? I think that was the main point because they don't want to confuse periodization with programming. Periodization is your blueprint that you lay out. It's a modifiable living document that gives you an endpoint. It guides you towards your goal, which is that your set competition. So that date doesn't change unless there's a, an odd outcome. But nationals occurs on this date. The Olympics occurs on this date. And periodization is your blueprint that leads to that date. Now, when you have a blueprint, you have to then build from the blueprint and how you build is your programming. And that's your sets, reps, repetitions, rest periods, all of those factors that everyone really likes to talk about. Those come from the blueprint and that helps to design the training plan when you have the the end goal in mind. And so, you know, your training is going to look completely different in early stages than late stages on purpose. And then even within a phase, it's going to look different. They're going to be different days, they're going to be different weeks, but it's that beginning goal that your blueprint has that carries you there. And then how you manifest that in each session is programming. And they're separate, and that's why they're not found within any of the definitions that you read of periodization. Yeah, no, I I, I agree. And I think that's where a lot of confusion initially starts is, mistaking one for the other and saying like, well, I don't want to do, you know, this style of block periodization because I don't, I don't think it's the most effective way to do it. Therefore you can kind of throw that baby out with the bathwater instead of saying like, Oh, here's like a broader 
broader plan or broader general structure or outline and we can kind of plug and play as we want and and honestly as long as you kind of emphasize those points of like being logical phasic it can look a lot of different ways and i've seen a lot of people have and you say look a lot of different ways um you know that's like saying like whoa two you know you have you know 10 different people they all look very very different it's like yeah myopically but they're all people and people inherently have a lot of similar qualities so it's like the point zero zero five percent might be different and and i think that's kind of the same with with programming when you take this concept of periodization you have a plan the program itself you could have a thousand different programs but i think the similarity would be much more pronounced than the differences and and you would say well yeah but this person is doing snatch sets of five off the blocks that's you know that's cray cray and it's like no it snatches off the blocks it just happens to be for more reps than you prefer that's not it's not like wildly different um so i think it's kind of expanding this understanding of the definition to say like we're all doing weightlifting we're all trying to create some logical phasic plan to get us there which is the end goal which is uh peak performance the the variables themselves chris maybe you can kind of take us down this lane of, of understanding them for the adaptations. When we think about the variables that create a program, we have load. So we have the percent of one RM, we have volume, which is reps and sets. Um, and then ultimately tonnage, we have the exercises and we have the frequency. I think those are like four huge pillars. It's weight on the bar for the number of reps and sets in a specific, specific movement pattern. And then it's frequency throughout. And then uh, you like, very uh, wisely added reversibility. So everything we end up developing, how do those change over time? Um, how do those how do those decay? How do those develop? So when you think about a program and you think about those pillars uh, that constitute the training, how do you start to conceptualize point A, which is the start of a of a training training program? a very start of a periodized plan to competition date. How do you think about all of that? Maybe abstractly. So it's not like too specific of a question. Yeah. So if you think about your major training principles, you have uh, specificity, you have variation, and then you have, uh, what am I missing? Reversibility. What's the fourth one I'm missing, Josh? Overload. Overload. Yeah. The most important one, overload. So, if you have those four characteristics in mind, then you can begin to design your plan starting at time point A, which is typically right after your last competition. And at this time, most likely you're going to have a lower work capacity because your volume is going to be the lowest that it's typically been. And you're going to need to reestablish that characteristic. Now, depending on how seasoned you are, that can take more or less time. That typically means that exercises are going to be more general in nature. They're not going to look exactly like the competition exercises. They could be quite different, in fact, when it comes to work capacity. It's a general quality. Uh, your volume is going to be quite high. You're going to build to your highest volumes at that time. And your intensities are going to be relatively low because you can't really do high volumes of high intensity work uh, and recover properly. At this time, you don't really need to worry about reversibility because you're farther out from competition. So that factor by itself is de-emphasized, but you are placing a large emphasis on the overload principle here, like building across the weeks, escalating the loads that you're using, and then reestablishing your work capacity. So that's going to be your farthest stage out from a meet. And it's from that work capacity that you develop that you can move into your moderate stages of training. Now you can handle more loading, you can recover more quickly, and you've likely put on some muscle size if that was your goal during that phase. So those kind of go hand in hand with your work capacity phase when you do those volumes of work. Then in the middle, this is where training becomes difficult for many people because there now is an intersection between volume and intensity. And this is where people can really not feel very good. And this is when people will uh, maybe you have high RPE values, they might become highly fatigued. And that's because you're doing the type of training to stimulate adaptations. 
This is where specificity starts to kick in more because you're working on people's weaknesses and that's directed towards the three lifts, right? Snatch, clean, and jerk. What are they deficient in? What do we need to direct our training adaptations to? And then we saturate the program with frequency. How often do I need to attack that given quality within a week to make it happen? So maybe I'm pretty good at the clean, but I'm lesser qualified at the snatch and jerk. So more days are going to be taken up by snatching and jerking. And the number of remedial exercises at this time is probably greater to correct for those deficiencies. And so uh, during that phase, really specificity becomes more important because your specificity is directed at removing their weaknesses. The final phase, the volume becomes the lowest because now you have to lift very intensely as often as you can. Overload is important here, but then we have to get into reversibility at this time because with the volume being low, how far can we get away from certain fitness qualities without them going away, right? How often can we do them within a micro cycle to maintain them while emphasizing the high degree of skill execution and lifting near limit loads right before competition? And so that's where it becomes really important to manipulate the variables and be highly attuned to how your athlete is responding and adjusting on those days and knowing, okay, if I hit a heavy squat at least once per week, I'll maintain my strength. And that's going to allow me to dedicate my other training means to high power outputs, lifting the weights in more of a competition style and focusing on recovering for the next session, knowing that I can maintain strength during that phase. That's not really the focus at, at that time. It's great to hit some squat PRs, but that may not occur during that time because the emphasis is on the, the high degree of specificity of executing the lifts. Mm -hmm. So without getting into too many specifics of each phase, that's how, how it kind of delineate your three phases uh, leading up to competition. No, and I, I think that was fantastic. It was a great overview, really emphasized the role of those training variables and how they changed across time to ultimately peak performance, which was manipul manipulating volume, manipulating intensity, how the athlete might perceive that or feel. Um, I think one thing I'd like to focus on, and actually, I, I like the fact, <laughs> I like the fact that we wrote about this. Uh, I like the fact this was brought up in the book, which is emphasis, the process of like de-emphasis and emphasis, which is thinking about the clean and jerk as two movements and also as one complex. So what I mean by that is you, you know, you can train the clean, you can train the jerk separately. You could also do a lot of clean and jerking. Uh, and those are, you know, those can be slightly different programs. And I think they can have slightly different effects or results to where if you only do cleans and only do jerks separately, when you attempt to put them together, you might not be quite skilled enough to express your performance. Uh, with that being said, if you only do clean and jerks, you know, it basically, it, it, it could be akin almost to, well, every time I bench, I bench after I squat. Every time I deadlift, I deadlift after I bench. And although it's not, it's not going to hurt too much. It's not the most ideal way to approach it. Sometimes maybe you bench before you squat. Uh, sometimes you deadlift before you squat. Sometimes you move exercises around, break them up and piece them together to maximize the, tr the training resources you have when you get into the gym. Sometimes, honestly, that's not even doing that exercise first. And that's why we use primers. It's coming in and saying, maybe I don't feel great. Um, maybe I'm not kind of ready to go. If I do some sort of exercise primer or movement primer, once I'm kind of like in the groove, I can snatch well and I can feel good about it. So Chris, when you start to think about the clean and jerk, how do you approach developing them to maximize clean and jerk performance while also being cognizant of the fact that we're likely going to need to break them up to train them effectively? Yeah, when we look into the phases, we're probably going to be very far out from competition, separating the two. And then earlier in the week, when your training energy is the highest, you're probably going to place whichever lift is least uh, qualified at that time. So if you struggle with the jerk, jerk should probably come first in the program and it can probably have its own day, right? Not the only exercise you do, but you may not clean and then do the jerk exercise. You might just come in, prep, and then do the jerk. And then you might do some other exercises after squatting, pressing, and the like. 
And the farther out from competition, you may have more days like that. You know, it could be as much as some people can clean 10, 10 kilos more than they can jerk. Do we need to dedicate two days to cleaning if you're cleaning 10 kilos more? Maybe not, especially if you're more intermediate to advanced. That might be a time where you have, you know, two or three snatch days, two or three jerk days and one clean day really far out from competition. And then it allows you to get more variations and more training energy dedicated to the jerk. Then in the next phase, some of your days will probably drop out of the jerks and you might move to more of a, uh, a day of doing the clean and jerk together. It doesn't have to be a classic clean and jerk. It could now maybe be a complex that targets the jerk, you know, such as a, a clean front squat plus jerk, right? It makes you a little bit more tired for the jerk, but then it gives you confidence knowing that you did that extra squat in between as you build. And so then that middle phase, you're probably having more clean and jerk days together. But if that's your weakness, you probably still have a dedicated day to the jerk, right? It's a technical variation, maybe from the blocks or uh, you do some other remedial exercise there. And you might put more supporting exercises in and around jerk drives, dip drives, things like that. And then, of course, the final phase, competition has the clean and jerk. You got to do it together. And so you're going to have multiple days of the clean and jerk. I mean, most people have one or two days built in there. You could have more depending on how your system is set up. But that last phase, there's no way to get away from it. I mean, I don't know any real weightlifters that don't do the clean and jerk together in the last yeah. phase. You don't just show up at competition day and hope for the best, right? So you put those together as you go. But I think not being afraid to split them apart and really get away from the traditional movement in early phases is, is totally fine. Yeah, I agree entirely. I think that I think that really mirrors how we how we discuss the clean and jerk in the book. And it's kind of funny as we're talking and as I'm going through the book to like get prompted, I'm like, wow, I didn't realize this was so real, well written. Uh, so that's always a pleasant surprise. So I think people will really enjoy it when they get their hands on it, uh, which, by the way, if you go to the weightlifting house website, there is a 20 percent off sale. I believe it's for the rest of the week. Uh, for this and the weightlifters guide to the snatch, you can pick them both up. You can pick one of them up. And I think it's, it's going to be a really insightful read. And, you know, there are plenty of guys who are really smart. I mentioned Carl Penny. He reached out immediately after the launch and he's like, Hey, I'm going to buy this at lunch and I don't know what I'm going to learn, but I, I feel like there's something I can pick up. Um, and I, I think that's kind of the mindset we all have of, you know, I'll listen to a thousand and one weightlifting podcasts with no really no true, no true understanding of what I'm going to learn or take away from it, but the hope that there's something there. And I think that that curiosity and that, um, I like drive to know more is, is really beneficial. So for everyone listening, I'd really implore you to, to pick up a copy of the book, check it out. Let us know what you think. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback. The last thing I'd like to touch on Chris, and this kind of rounds out the whole conversation because we, we opened it up broadly with the history of the sport narrowed it with like the biomechanical kind of considerations and non-negotiables funneled that into periodization programming and developing individual phases for individual lifts now when we think about exercise selection uh, i mentioned in the book the constraints led approach and this is you know something that i really heard championed and popularized by by keith davids uh, who's a renowned world-renowned skill acquisition expert just really sharp guy and this is basically the process of like constraining movement to force um, uh, different movement strategies to emerge. So it's basically this idea of saying when you're sprinting, I'm going to put mini hurdles in front of you. So you have to pick your feet and knees up. Um, kind of that same idea. You have you have this like almost borderline subconscious. It, no, it actually is subconscious. You have this way of performing a movement. It's by de it's likely by definition and, and by any uh, degree of dissection inefficient. So, oh, I like to clean without making contact. That feels normal, and that's just how I do it. That's wrong. That's just, I mean, it's just it's outright wrong. So we would constrain that movement to say, okay, well, how do we force you then to one pull faster after contact, two keep the bar close, do all these things that we know emphasize the lift and, and help create more efficiency. Uh, and, and the process is through this constraints-led approach, which is maybe it's pulling away contact. 
maybe it's pulling away hook grip. Maybe it's pulling away foot movement. Maybe it's, you know, um, muscle variations. We kind of break that down of like how they would fit into sessions, how they would fit into different blocks, the load that would be used. When you think about a constraints led approach, how do you conceptualize that with weightlifting? Maybe you can give us some of your favorite exercises or way of creating movements to enhance movements. Express the passion that defines you. At Virus, we understand that when it comes to performance, the slightest edge can mean the difference between winning and losing. Each product is designed and tested with performance in mind. This principle inspired the technology that is infused into our apparel. Built with the intention to move with you and work for you, we create tools meant to help express the passion that defines you. The future of technology-driven apparel. Improve performance, prevent fatigue, recover faster, and go further. Virus is a proud sponsor of Josh Gibson and the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast. Use code PHILWL for 10% off at checkout. That's PHILWL WL for 10% off. Yeah, that's, that's great. You know, the first thing I always think about with this is working with the athlete. So the first thing I always want to do is say, what are you feeling? Do you understand what you're doing wrong? And then trying to fix it that way first. Cause sometimes they don't even know, like you say, like you did this, but the athlete has no idea. They just agree because you're the coach, right? <laughs> and you're like, this isn't working. Try this. And they're like, okay. So first asking them, what are you feeling in the movement? Like they, if you're doing this wrong, can you tell you're doing it wrong? Sometimes they can't. So video feedback is helpful. Like film the lift and show them like right here, you didn't make contact with the bar. And they're like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. And then they can visualize it in their head and that helps. So being on the same page with what you're trying to do that session is very important. And then knowing where they are in the training plan is also important because there may not be enough time to fix a given item right away. You might have to put it later. But assuming you have enough time and the athlete understands what you're doing, then you're going to find out what the error is and you're going to pick an exercise to help remediate that error. Yeah. And so that comes down to your exercise selection and being creative with what you have available. So uh, maybe you need to go from the blocks for a little while. Maybe you need to go from the hang. Uh, you mentioned, you know, no feet. You could go no hook, no contact even for, for some people for a period of time to elicit the outcome that you want when you move back into the more classic ver variations of the lift. So those are all great ones. Um, I like throwing in pulls plus lifts, right? Sometimes you do a pull and then a lift and that lets them feel where they are in the lift. If maybe they're missing their balance and their feet can really help. Uh, often going from the hang can take a very complex movement and make it more simple. Going from the hip, there's less things that can go wrong than going from below the knee. So sometimes we need to back it up so that there's less room for errors to occur. And then as they become more proficient, then we can increase the difficulty and complexity of the movement. So those are all ways that you can use a constraints led approach in the lifts, uh, regardless of whether it's a clean or jerk. So you really have to understand where the error is coming from and then what the most appropriate exercise is to remediate that error and how many sessions you need per week of that stimulus to accomplish that. Yeah, and I think a, a really important point and one I wish I would have maybe ingrained a little bit earlier on is there are no hard and fast rules to any of this. Like th really the main thing is, are you getting better? Are you improving in, in the way that we want you to improve? And that's, that's, I mean, that's across the board, right? Because there's, there's something that can be measured and assessed and monitored. And you're saying, are we getting to the spot we need to get to? And when I think about movement, I think about all the people I've taken from, you look like a pile of shit on a you know slab of concrete. And it's like moving from that to, okay, this is, this is really efficient. This is really good. We can alter training now. We can change training <laughs> you know, between A and B of like shit on, a con on, on concrete to like good movement. 
it really doesn't matter what you do. And, and I say that is you can kind of use that like Ox, Occam, Occam's razor approach of, well, let's not do more than needed. Let's do as much as we need. Uh, but basically uh, you can you can take many different approaches and they, they can all help you develop technique. The reason I bring this up is because when I started in weightlifting, people said you shouldn't use certain exercises or train in certain ways. And it's like, that's just, that's outright false whatever is going to allow you to develop. So if you, you know, aren't a believer in no contact, I mean, give it a shot. Like, I mean, if it, if it doesn't help, stop doing it. But like this idea of use whatever tools you have from A to B, make sure there's like this excessive approximation to the, to the outcome. And then once you get there, it, again, you're not going to look back and say like, well, the process we used was really complicated. It's like, but you got to that point. So you can always refine that process, but I don't think it has to look any individual way. There are really no kind of like uh, wrong ways to do it necessarily. They're just more or less efficient ones. So when you when you kind of read through the book after you, after you pick it up, if you haven't already, you can look through some of the con constraints we have, some of the ways we have of designing sessions, some of the ways we have of, of conceptualizing the, the clean and jerk and, the, and the, the structure of your training with it. And just approximate what you think is best and, and alter it. There's no right or wrong. Again, they're just like better and worse ways to do it. The better way is the one that gets you there most efficiently. The worst way is the one that gets you going backwards. So uh, I'll kind of leave off with a quote before, before, as we're closing out. I'll leave off with a quote. Uh, I said this to, to, to a kid. Um, training that's hard and productive is good training. Training that's hard and it makes you worse is hell. And, and I believe that to be true. It's like you can train hard and you get better and that's just good. That's just good training. It doesn't really matter what it looks like. Training that's hard and either keeps you plateauing or moving backwards, that's masochistic. <laughs> um, so don't get caught in that second camp. Uh, buy the book, improve your training of the clean and jerk, pick up the snatch book if you don't already have it. And that can help you take your snatch to a new level. Chris, if people are interested to keep in keeping up with your work, what you do, uh, and the projects you're involved with, can you can you direct them there? Yeah, I'm on Instagram, Dr. Chris Tabor. I'm on Twitter. Um, you can find me on my school page if you just want to shoot me an email. I'll respond to anything you send over, and you can find me on any any of those. Now, do you still have spots for students if they're interested? I do. I have. Uh, Still two more research spots available if you want to come to school. Uh, we're like a month away from getting rolling, but I have some funding for people to come do research with me. And I have some positions open if you want to do strength and conditioning. I have two of those coaching high school athletes, and those are two funded positions. So if you want to get your master's and you want to get your school paid for, let me know. Awesome. That sounds great. I mean, it sounds like a luxury and, and something I wish I would have known about kind of earlier on. Uh, if people are interested in keeping up with me, it's Josh underscore Phil WL on Instagram. That's P-H-I-L-W-L. It's philosoph philosophical weightlifting everywhere else. Make sure you pick up a copy of the Weightlifter's Guide to the Clean and Jerk on weightliftinghouse.com. Uh, can easily find it there. There, We'll link it down below. And then we'll keep all of the relevant details in the show notes. Thanks again for tuning in and we will catch you all next week. Mm -hmm.